This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Joan Williams. She is a distinguished professor of law at the University of California. She refers to herself proudly as a San Francisco liberal. Yours truly, the guy talking to you right now, I don't know what I am these days. I'm not a San Francisco liberal. I'm probably in this libertarian type camp, but I'm kind of on the lam, so to speak. So I can't really affix my name to a city in the States. Now, what does that crazy setup of two people get? The setup of Joan and the setup of myself? A conversation. A conversation with its roots at what is the appeal of Donald Trump? Joan's book, White Working Class, Overcoming Class Cluelessness in America. I enjoyed this conversation because I don't think in this day and age of this bipolar, your side, my side, there's not a conversation. And even if you're listening right now and you immediately say to yourself, I don't want to listen to Joan. She says she's a San Francisco liberal. Hey, hold on, hold tight. Joan's pretty objective. She's laying it out there and at least seeing what the appeal of Trump is. Now, of course, Trump supporters know what the appeal of Trump is. No debate for them. I enjoy getting into the middle of something very controversial, but where both sides are attempting to find an answer. Both sides might have their bias. They might have their home team, but at least there's some objectivity here. At least it's not naked partisanship. So as we look around the world and we see populist movements growing and growing, there's a reason for it. It's not because they're necessarily bad people, as some on the left would like to say. And as someone on the right would like to say, it doesn't mean they're all good either. But there's a reason for why things are unfolding. And this white working class in America is a very potent political force. Just take, for example, the election of Donald Trump. Without any further delay, without any further setup, let's jump right into my conversation with Joan Williams. So, Joan, I was thinking to myself, after the election, after Trump was elected, It was a surprise. At least that's what was positioned in the mainstream media and positioned by, for example, Hillary Clinton. I really tend to think that behind the scenes, there were plenty of, let's say, liberal intelligentsia that thought this is not a surprise. I mean, for example, maybe Van Jones said on TV that he was a little surprised. But I bet behind the scenes, a guy like Van Jones was saying to himself, this did not surprise me at all. I don't think it probably surprised you. Oh, it didn't surprise me. I had this sinking feeling weeks before the election, and I was spending more and more time at Clinton headquarters here in San Francisco because I just had this sinking feeling that she was going to lose. I spent a lot of time on the phone talking to people. I remember talking to one Latinx gal. I was speaking to her in Spanish because I grew up partly in Venezuela. She was saying she wasn't going to vote. I couldn't figure out whether she wasn't going to vote or was going to vote for Trump. I said to her, es un hombre bien peligroso. He's a really dangerous man. It was just clear she wasn't convinced. And I'm going like, we are so up a creek. If after what Trump has done, Latinx voters are reacting this way. And in fact, ultimately, according to some statistics, which I believe, although some people deny them, about 30% of Latinx voters voted for Trump. So now let's unpack that. You give people a perspective on where you're coming from, but you're probably going to surprise them where your writing and research goes because you seem to be a pretty objective lady. So as you mentioned, 
your perspective out of the gate there. The audience listening immediately has a feeling where they think they know where you're coming from. But, you know, America is a pretty divided place these days. So 50 percent of the country would be like, I don't care. 50 percent of the country would be like, OK, I agree with her. That's a really interesting uh, territory to wade into. And you started to wade into it to unpack it. I did. I mean, I have spent most of my time working on race and gender, but I have also always from the beginning worked on social class. I don't know if I'm objective. I don't know if anyone's objective. I mean, I have a very distinct point of view. I'm a San Francisco liberal, always been very open about that. I also understand that Even people who pride themselves on being sensitive on race and gender issues and to race and gender hierarchies sometimes are sublimely clueless about how social class plays out in American life and American politics. I had trouble actually finding an audience for that. I wrote a book, I think it was in 2009, talking about that to crashing silence, except among sociologists. But then when I left that election night party, the night that Trump was elected, I just thought, I'm just going to say what everybody needs to hear, and I don't care about the pushback because it's just too important. Believe me, there's been lots of pushback. It is really important for people to understand the social class dynamic that is dominating not only American politics, it's dominating Brexit. It's dominating throughout Europe. It's dominating in Israel. It's dominating in many, many places. It is an amazing piece of work that you've put together, starting with the article. And I want to start there in a second. But as you say, self-described San Francisco liberal, to go ahead and write what you have written. And that's what I meant objectively. It does seem very objective to me. I grew up more Republican. So it does seem, okay, someone is giving a fair perspective here. But the pushback must have been pretty crazy because I don't remember you getting primetime spots on the CNN to discuss it like you're discussing it. And again, you're not trying to say everything's great on the Trump side or anything like that or the white working class side, but you're just describing it. Is there any particular pushback example before we dive into the content that you could describe for the audience? Well, I think there's been a lot of pushback, not only against the argument that what lost the election was the economic anxiety of the white working class. The kind of liberal consensus at this point is that it's not really about economic anxiety. It's about racial anxiety and racial pushback. And of course, those two things are interrelated. They're particularly interrelated when Steve Bannon brilliant guy that he is, has been really open that as long as we can keep them talking about race and we're talking about economic nationalism, we're going to be awesome on the right. Trying to explain to people that sometimes economic anxiety is very much intertwined with anxiety about losing your place and often gets channeled into open racism by some people at the top that these are not mutually exclusive. Often what's happened is this economic anxiety is being distorted and expressed as racial anxiety. The alternative is to say to people, hey, you're getting angry at the wrong people. Or you can say to people, I hear you're really upset about losing your hold on the middle class. And I have a pretty robust prediction as to which one's going to be more effective, scolding people or listening to them. So let's take it back to after the election. You decided to write and you put out an article. Harvard Business Review posted it. 3.2 million people checked it out. 3.6, actually. 3.6. Okay. A lot of people came out and said early on, hey, this is something you really need to check out if you want to understand the mind of at least a certain subset of the Trump voter. Why don't you talk about that article and how that came to be? Well, I'm a Silver Spoon girl, born and bred, but I married into a white working class family over 40 years ago. I realized very quickly, not quickly enough, but very quickly, that the culture and some of the taken for granted assumptions of that 
family were super different from the ones in my family. Just a really simple example, one of the early times my mother-in-law visited me, she said, oh, where do you put your butter? And I was like, that was such a silly question. I just off the cuff, I said, oh, under the bed. And she went and put the butter under my bed. That's how weird she thought I was. <laughs> That's how different the taken for granted assumptions are. Really, the professional managerial elite, the top 16, 20%, they are very focused on self-development. They are very focused on taking chances, interested in everything in the 70s, new sexual norms to today, gender fluidity. All of those make perfect sense in the context of growing up in an environment where you're being brought up to fill professional jobs where thinking for yourself and being able to speak up for yourself are really highly valued. People who are in blue collar families are quite focused on self-discipline, the kind that gets you up every day, out of bed, on time, to work without an attitude, to an often not very fulfilling job. The elites, they figure what I need to do is to bring my best self and all my creativity to the job. But if you do that in a blue collar job, it's called having an attitude and it can get you fired. This dichotomy between being focused on self-development and having the felt entitlement to develop your full self versus being focused on self-discipline and looking down on people who don't have it is a very profound cultural divide in the United States. The other thing is that the elite, there's a different set of emotion rules between the elite and blue collar folks. In the elite, you know exactly who you're supposed to feel sorry for and guilty for. You're supposed to feel very bad about racial hierarchy, kind of bad about gender hierarchy. You're supposed to be really emotionally bonded with immigrants, LGBTQ community. The emotion rules in blue collar environments are often really different they often are very focused on tradition, the kind of traditions that keep people on the straight and narrow and help them with that self-discipline. So they're often much more religious, much more traditional in terms of their family ideals. The emotion rules are very different. They're often very bonded with the unborn fetus and very upset about abortion, for example. They're very focused on the plight of working class whites who are in so despair, they're like dying despair deaths. I think it's really important to recognize that these emotion rules are very, very different in these two different groups of people. And often that really sets them against each other. I just listened very carefully to every word you said for those descriptions looking for a place where I could kind of like say, oh, I don't know. I think that's a very fair assessment. It's very fair. The trick from my perspective is it seems like in America today, through media especially, is that you can't have one of those perspectives. One side is saying, we've got our perspective. The other side is saying, we've got our perspective. And I guess the word deplorable would have been a great example to define. You just defined white working class. But for example, the candidate that lost to Trump defined that same white working class, maybe not entirely accurately to say it with one word, but that's how it got positioned as deplorables. And that seems like a real problem in modern America, that there can't be these two sides right now. These two sides have always existed, but now it's like the knives are out. Yeah, certainly there's been a real breakdown of civility, decency, being a grown up. In American politics, arguably exactly the same thing that has happened in Britain. I mean, again, I'm very open about my political views. I think Donald Trump and I think Boris Johnson are both profoundly irresponsible people. But I think what's really so corrosive is Donald Trump's famous statement, I could kill someone on Fifth Avenue and my base wouldn't care. People have a hard time understanding why. And I think there's a very simple reason why. Donald Trump, one South Carolina voter said, I voted with my middle finger 
for Trump. Donald Trump is extremely brilliant at one thing, and that is channeling anger at elites. He is their middle finger. That's why even as he engages in very irresponsible and, in my opinion, often illegal behavior, the elites get more and more upset about it. That just helps him with his base, because although the base often feels belittled and ignored, and frankly, they have been belittled and ignored, they finally found a way to get to the elites and drive them completely crazy. And his name is Donald. Let me throw something at you. You said something earlier. You mentioned you were describing the elite perspective and being more comfortable. And you gave a couple examples. And one, you said gender fluidity. So I think one of the most interesting things that I've seen in the last handful of years is that New York City has defined 31 genders. The typical white working class male if he hears that New York City has defined 31 genders, he really doesn't get mad about the 31 genders. That's not what he's getting mad about. From my perspective, he's getting mad that some elite group somewhere defined a number of 31 and they didn't pick 30. They didn't pick 5,000. They didn't pick 7,000 or a million. The white working class just looks at that as another example of elites inside government run amok. I think you can find untold numbers of examples to where that's one of the reasons I think that the white working class and this practical, traditional fairness type perspective just throw their arms up. And as you said, they vote for the guy that's got the middle finger up. Yeah. I mean, I think from my point of view, certainly one of the forges of class anger has been these cultural issues for sure. And that's been true since the 70s. It used to be that Democrats were very focused on blue collar economic issues and Republicans were very focused on the economic interests of big business and small business. That used to be the configuration. Then what happened in the 70s is that the Democrats began to, and Republicans, began to focus on these cultural issues, of which the current example is the 31 genders. I think what has really been lost is the reason I think that white working class guy is so angry is because his father could support his family in a solid middle class life with a well-paying blue-collar job with benefits and only maybe intermittent work by his wife, the wages used to rise when productivity did from roughly the 40s until roughly the 70s. And then that stopped. Today, most of the gains from productivity go to the very top few percent of Americans. If wages had continued to rise when productivity did, the way they did between roughly 1945 and 1975, wages would be double what they are today. Now, Trump talked about that. In my opinion, he has not helped that. In fact, when he was a real estate developer, he regularly stiffed and did not pay blue collar guys. Democrats, God bless their hearts, they never mentioned that. Those people should have been all over Clinton's campaign. So I think what has happened is, in my opinion, the Trump tax cuts were a good example. I mean, Trump did give a few hundred dollars to middle class families and temporary cuts, but he gave massive cuts to the extremely wealthy, his set. The fact is nobody's talking about, nobody's delivering for these people on this issue. People have been looking at rural incomes going down, blue collar incomes going down, such that Many, many people whose parents had a solid standard of living now try to patch together three jobs, maybe five part-time jobs in a family. They're in the gig economy. They don't have health insurance. A lot of them lost their houses in 2008 and then saw huge bailouts for banks, but not for homeowners. There's just a huge amount of anger because the American middle class has been eviscerated. And in fact, there are studies that show that the benefits of globalization have gone wildly to the top few percent. 
And they have really helped bring whole groups of people in Asia into the middle class. They have hollowed out the middle class in industrialized countries. Economic populism, as I keep saying, it's about economics. So here's a great add to what you just said, and I think you'll concur. Of course, China makes things cheaper. We in America, starting with Walmart, wow, the selection is insane. The prices are great. Walmart family has got more wealth than like 50% of the country or something crazy like that. And then it moved on to the internet. And now Jeff Bezos has got $150 billion. I don't have anything negative to say about either of those, the family or Jeff, to having that success. They're entrepreneurs. They took risks. It worked out in their way in an insane way. Now that that's happened, this is where we are. And I wonder if that white working class, which I want you to define a little bit more too, if that white working class realizes, I mean, they must know the game. They know that Walmart owns everything. They know that Jeff Bezos is the richest guy in the world. They probably have a feeling that it's not coming back. So then are they siding with Trump just because, not necessarily because they're going to get the economic populism, that they're going to get the economics back, but it's kind of like just picking your team that sounds more like you, even if they really don't think it's ever going to come back. Yeah. I mean, I think they were really hoping that he would bring good jobs back. He told them he was going to bring good jobs back. Every politician says that since the dawn of time. (laughs) Well, he talked a lot more about it in ways that were resonant and to areas that were really hurting than Clinton did. I mean, Clinton didn't even visit a lot of those areas. And I really think that people are looking at their standard of living and they're just fit to be tied. They're so angry. You think about it, they were very disillusioned. Trump at least said he was going to help them. And he delivered kind of this social honor of you are people. I like the poorly educated, he said, with his usual tact and articulateness. He was trying to offer that. He was offering them both jobs and social honor. I think Clinton was a little class clueless and wasn't, I mean, she was obviously class clueless. She called people deplorables, bless her heart. She was focused more on these self-development issues. She also talked about jobs, but she just wasn't effective. Do you think, though, that when she used something like deplorables, that was off the cuff? Or was that a very strategic decision to think that we could get the right number of voters to win? There was a theory back then that demography was destiny and that we were going to have a majority-minority population, and that was the future of the Democratic Party. That's before people understood that, again, African Americans vote very heavily Democratic, but Latinx voters and Asian Americans do not vote on Democratic in anything like the same proportions. Also, the configuration of what constitutes whiteness changes a lot. I mean, after all, my family's partly Italian, partly Jewish. Neither of those groups were considered white in the United States in the 19th century. But I think that many Asians, we're going to have a reconfiguration of whiteness. And many Asians and many Latinx voters are going to consider themselves white. The kind of racial dynamic is going to be very, very different from African Americans. I mean, I guess my distress is that neither party is really focused on front, square, and center on these economic issues. In some ways, Elizabeth Warren is focused on curbing the power of huge businesses. That's definitely part of it. Delivering a solid middle-class life is really, I think, what people are yearning for, both in the UK and in the US. Absent that, as for second best, they will settle for someone who channels their anger against the elite. But In my view, that's second best. The other thing to realize is that we've been focused on right working class men, but Trump has lost quite a lot of support among white working class women for obvious reasons. That is a group that he carried by 28 points. I mean, if Clinton had even gotten half of those voters, she would have won. But I think that his support among those voters has really diminished. I want to keep you at the challenging the elite part for a second. I tend to think 
and I watched it closely. I tend to think that if Bernie Sanders was the nominee, he probably would have won. I tend to think that if Elizabeth Warren was the nominee in 2016, she probably would have won. I think one thing that I don't see a lot of is that this white working class, when it comes to the elites and they're looking down on, is that they don't look at the resume that Hillary Clinton has and think to themselves, I'm impressed. They think to themselves, okay, her husband was president. She had every advantage under the sun to get to those positions. It was much easier to become a senator when your husband was the president, et cetera, et cetera. The left says, hold on, she's a very accomplished woman. That's ridiculous. But that's not how the white working class look at it, in my humble opinion. I tend to think that if there would have been a candidate at that time that Trump was running that did not have this kind of she's been chosen and she will just be pushed into the spot, whereas Bernie was out there rough and tumble, talking, getting a lot of votes, and then it looked like the elite crushed Bernie and didn't give him a fair chance. And I think the white working class observes all of that. And that's some of the stuff they don't like. It seems not fair. It seems like this seems kind of rigged. I mean, Bernie was talking about the rigged economy. And you know what? The economy is rigged. It's rigged in favor of a very small group. So I think that was a breath of fresh air. There's been a lot of reports that some people who voted for Bernie in the primaries then voted for Trump. I think it's impossible to tell what would have happened if Bernie had been the candidate. And it's impossible to tell what will happen this time. One element, though, I have to say that contributed to the really deep hatred that a lot of voters had for Hillary is just downright sexism. I mean, Trump's likability ratings were below Hillary's. But the difference was that her unlikability mattered and his didn't. Because if you look at prescriptive stereotypes of men, men are supposed to be direct, assertive, competitive. And if you look at the stereotypes of women, women are supposed to be modest, self-effacing, nice, and likable. Not being likable is often unforgivable in a woman candidate, whereas in a man, it's kind of optional. Class played a really important role in the last election, but gender did too. And that's also happening right now. I mean, Elizabeth Warren today has been attacked basically because she encountered pregnancy discrimination. So now she's being faulted on the grounds that she didn't handle the pregnancy discrimination right or it didn't happen. I've never heard of a male candidate who was disadvantaged because he encountered sex discrimination. That is a difficult issue because it's going to be impossible to ever get men to really look at it from that perspective, at least until we have a situation in America where we regularly have presidents that are male, female, black, white. Until we get to that point where there's enough of a sample size going forward to multiple women have become president, I think there's kind of that first opportunity to get the chance. It seems like we're battling a lot of that as well. Yeah, I mean, people are being driven by stereotypes because having a woman is still so unusual that these stereotypes of likability also play a profound influence in the professional workplace. On the stereotypes part, too, I wanted to open it up to something that I know is you've done a lot of work in. I find post the election, if we look at the bell curve, we know that on the edges, at least, there is racism in America. We know on the very, very thin edges, there are somewhere in America Nazis. But we've gone from the edges of the bell curve. My observation would be is that 50% of the country or those that vote for Trump are truly these people. I mean, post the election, there was a lot of commentary. Like people seemed to, I don't know if it was just hyperbole or just rabble rousing, but people were talking about concentration camps inside America. People were talking about really horrible things. And so as an outsider, and I've spent the last seven years in Asia observing this from afar, it seems like that this group that votes for Trump or perhaps the 50% that might vote right are really in mainstream media positioned as racist. That seems like that's also another... I mean, look, and those same people are going to look at the left and have their stereotypical views. But what is your perspective on the fact, I want to say fact, but what is your perspective on the notion that America has become 
more so than ever, this racist nation. In addition to my book, White Working Class, there's a new book out with some new data on this. It's called Merge Left, and it's by Ian Haney Lopez. So Lopez is the last name. What he points out is that these people in the middle, he calls them the persuadable, they're like almost 60% of the electorate, they hold some very progressive views about race, and they hold some pretty retrograde views about race. To say that they're all just irredeemable racists ignores the fact that they hold some progressive views about race. Now, one of the things that he has found is that if you call out the Steve Bannon strategy of pitting Americans against each other by race, which, after all, what does that deflect attention to? That deflects attention from the fact that people of color and white people who are in the formerly middle class are all formerly middle class, and none of them are happy about it. But if you say some people are trying to divide us, wealthy, greedy special interests are trying to divide us, What we all need, Americans, black, white, and brown, is good jobs, good health care, good education at an affordable price. If we band together, we can get those things. That's a message that actually polls very well among persuadable voters. Calling them racists does not. (laughs) Who knew? Let me unpack something that I thought in your work was really interesting, the way that you defined And so when people hear the phrase working class, many times they might think poor, but working class and poor, these are different. I want you to elaborate there and explain and add to it as well that the working class don't really get upset about people being super rich and they really don't get upset necessarily about income inequality. Why don't you unpack that all for the audience? When I use working class... What I mean is really the middle class. I wanted to call this book not white working class, but white middle class, but people would have been confused, so we didn't. The critique is that, oh, if working class Americans were more likely to vote for Clinton than for Trump, data point, people, households with less than $30,000 were more likely to vote for Clinton than for Trump. Excuse me, they aren't middle class. Those are the poor. And they were more likely to vote for Clinton than for Trump. But that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the middle 53% of Americans' median income around $75,000. That is the group that went very strongly for Trump in these key Rust Belt states. Those are the group that saw their parents' middle class standard of living take a nosedive. I think the debate has been really influenced by confusion over what group we're talking about. The poor did not go heavily for Trump. The middle class did among whites. The other thing is that among the professional managerial elite, there's often a lot of emotional bonding with the poor and feeling like, oh, we really need to help out the poor. And there's often a lot of belittling, also belittling of the rich on the grounds that they're just greedy. And here we are professionals, we're government workers, we're following our ideals. Some people are just out there kind of grabbing bucks and we don't respect them. Among the working class, there's kind of the opposite. There's the belittling of the poor and there's respect for the rich. That's because a lot of Americans, a lot of middle class Americans see themselves as just about to be rich. That's the American dream, right? That's the American dream. They think of the rich as, well, either they think of them as job creators or they think of them as having worked very hard. It is true that many in the elite work very hard. It's also true that their work pays off a whole heck of a lot more than the person who is driving a gig economy job and has two part-time jobs to boot. That person's working really hard too. It's just not paying off. There's a lot of judgmentalism among the white working class and also to some extent among people of color about the poor. The kind of liberal view is that 
oh, the poor, they didn't have opportunities. But very often the middle class view is the poor just didn't try hard enough. The poor didn't have the self-discipline that I did. They didn't get up every single day at 5.30 and get to that not very fulfilling job. And I don't want to pay for them because I have to do this and I don't like it, but I do it. I keep my nose clean and I show up. There's a lot of pride in the fact that they haven't been dependent on other people and a lot of judgmentalism of the poor. These different attitudes towards the rich and the poor are really one of the key divides in American politics. There is a racial dimension, but it also goes beyond race. If you look, for example, at Hillbilly Elegy, J.D. Vance, who came from a white working class family, is extremely judgmental of the poor, black and white, all colors. That stems from the fact that people in his family who managed to make a go of it and create a stable middle class life had to work very hard at not very fulfilling jobs. Their attitude is like, I don't want to support people who aren't. Again, I'm a San Francisco liberal. I feel differently, but I can understand that point of view. And I also think that the real message here is that if you have policies that are going to make people's lives easier and give them fairer opportunities, they shouldn't be means tested programs that help the poor and leave the middle class out in the cold. Because then what you have is people who are just a little bit richer than people who get these programs. And they're going like, I'm not getting anything. Why am I paying for this? I think it's just a problem that can be solved by universal programs. After all, think of the different politics around Social Security and Medicare than the politics around so-called welfare or food stamps. The politics are totally different. Why? This is people listening right now, there's going to be both sides listening, but why have you, a San Francisco liberal that's willing to have this open conversation where you acknowledge the various seats at the table, why have you become a dinosaur? Because if I turn on, for example, if I turn on Sean Hannity, I'm going to see one thing. If I turn on Don Lemon, I'm going to see another thing. Those two sides never meet anywhere. Why do you exist? Because this doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist where somebody, I mean, look, if people, if the right, so to speak, hears a San Francisco liberal, they're going to think Nancy Pelosi and they're going to think, wow, that lady doesn't listen or understand anything about me. But you've just said, hey, I'm a San Francisco liberal and you have put on the table in this conversation a perspective. But why have you become so rare? What's happened in society? You know, it's hard to have a conversation about social class in the United States. It's hard because of the American dream, the American self-image that if you work hard in the United States, anyone can make it. Well, in fact, as we have said, a lot of people work hard. Some of them end up owning Amazon and some of them end up working in an Amazon warehouse with repetitive stress disorder because of the low wages. And that's no one's dream. That's no one's dream. In order to admit the powerful influence of social class, we have to acknowledge that people's life chances are very heavily influenced by social class. That goes against our really two deeply held beliefs. One is the American dream, anyone can make it. And the other is meritocracy, that the people who make it are the smartest people rather than the most privileged people. It's hard to have a conversation about class in America. I mean, the amazing thing is that we had it for a millisecond. We had it actually, in my experience, for about two years. The other reason it's hard to have this conversation is that you have these two sides deeply dug in. One side saying, oh, these people are just racist and homophobic and we aren't going to listen to them. And then the other people going... The elites are ripping you off. By the way, we're going to give a tax cut to the richest people in America. What you would need to realize to have a conversation is that maybe the elites can't always get their way when it comes to social issues. That would really require the elites to give up some power. Maybe elites from both sides of the spectrum have to realize that the economy that we have built 
where the gains of productivity go to a very thin sliver at the top. That economy, not only is it not working for the broad range of Americans, including the formerly middle class and those left behind, that economy is not working for the rich now. Look what we have in the US and the UK. We have, even as we talk today, Trump made a decision with respect to pulling out of, I think it was Syria, that has generals and very conservative people extremely upset. And the left, there's a lot of people don't like it. Everybody's upset. It's like, this is irresponsible. This is a direct result of economic populism, which is a direct result of economics going seriously awry for most Americans. This is not working for the right. This is not working for the left. This economy is no longer working for anyone. That's the message. This is a great point, though, because ultimately, you and I probably have a lot in common. Maybe not the content of what we do in our life, but what we have in common is that you are an individual who has put yourself into a niche. You have become an expert. You get compensated for that. I kind of do the same thing. We're kind of like, even though we might have alliances and jobs here or this or that, we're kind of like free agents in a way. I tend to think jobs is a four letter word and that maybe just maybe when you have something like the internet unfold and i still remember when i was sitting there in my late 20s watching netscape go public in 1995 and like wow this is a game changer this is a game changer everything's going to change and i just think that maybe we've not yet stepped forward into the future to realize that no president can quote really create jobs unless he's just moving tax money around or doing a tariff here or doing this But there's no way that an individual can just force a company to exist and then force jobs to exist. I mean, I think they're overall, whether you're on the left or the right, a lot more personal responsibility is going to be required to find success in the future. You know, I have to disagree with you there. First of all, I've had an old fashioned job and I have an old fashioned pension. I've been a professor for almost 40 years. And you know what? It's awesome. It's awesome to have a job. It's awesome to have a pension. It's awesome to have rights as an employee. That's what most people want. I do think that some in the professional managerial elite who have extreme self-confidence that they'll be able to give value add and support themselves, they're fine in the gig economy. And God bless, you know, if it works for them, God bless. That's not the way most Americans want to live. We have gutted employee protections. We have gutted, to some extent, a progressive tax system. We have allowed people who are owners to mistreat workers and to take far too large a percentage of the value add that they create without sharing it with those people who help them create it. That's the problem, in my view. I'm not a big believer in, oh, it's a brave new world of gig work. Gig work really eviscerates the lives of most people who do it, grossly underpaid. I'm not saying it's easy. I wonder how does, if you create a business in America and you want to sell products, somebody in China can make those products at such a discount, which of course means you're not going to hire people in America. And that little thought that I've just outlined right there is a big reason that you and I are having this conversation, a big reason why no one's happy about the economics, is that the world's gone global, and if business people, enterprising people, can make it cheaper somewhere else. Look, we all want an iPhone, and Steve Jobs set it in motion to make the dang things in China. So how do we solve that when American smarts says, hey, we're smart people, we want to make it cheaper, and let's go outside the States, and then all the jobs are gone. Isn't that what's happened? I think that is a lot what's happened. You have to look at an example of Germany, for example. Germany has been very, very conscientious about keeping good blue collar jobs in the way that an advanced industrialized country can. Germany makes the best scissors. China makes the cheapest scissors. Germany can't compete with that, but Germany can make the best scissors. There's a lot of ways that we in the United States could be competing that we're not because our corporations have an extremely ideology that labor is nothing but a cost to be contained as opposed to an asset to be trained and utilized 
to deliver high value added products that they are very short term focused. I mean, there's now a movement in business as a result of recognizing this economy is working for nobody, not even business, where a whole group of businesses, some of them very influential, have come out and said, just focusing on the short term and on maximizing shareholder return is not working for us. And I think that's the direction that we have to go in to see workers, society, all as stakeholders in a business. Because if it's all going to be about allowing the people with the most power and the money to put the most dollars into their pocket, what we're going to live with is permanent political instability. And you know what? That's really bad for business. Yeah, I don't think there's any disagreement there. When you have, I think what Jeff Bezos has done is absolutely fantastic. I just love the entrepreneurial side of it. But I am also cognizant of the fact that when one person has that much money, they can just control so much. And it it can be problematic. Let me just say, say one thing. I deeply admire what he's done too, but would it really hurt him to be half or a third as wealthy and actually pay his workers well and protect their health? That's the question. Yeah, and that's tricky. Should he be doing that on his own or by legislation, et cetera? And we could go down that rabbit hole for a long time, and maybe I will get you back, and we can. I would love to, because I really love having this kind of very open perspective. I don't get a chance to do this a lot. I have one last final point, though, that I wanted to bring up with you. You brought up Germany. I had mentioned that I've spent a lot of time in Asia, primarily maybe let's say the last seven years in Vietnam. I've been to China a lot. I think one of the interesting things when I observe some of these other countries is the homogeneity. Culturally, there does seem to be an advantage in some of the countries where the populations are homogenous. It does seem like, and of course, this is America is the melting pot. You know, that is what it is. But when you mentioned like a Germany, where we talk about a China, I think that Germans culturally worry about perhaps some of these things you're talking about more. There's more of a cultural bind where I think in America, we have pockets. And that's the whole conversation we're having right now. Is there's a pocket here and a pocket there. They're not bound together. Whereas if I watch a population like in Vietnam, this homogeneity is just amazing. The way that there's, it's like almost everybody's a brother and a sister. This is really tricky for America. Like, how do we get to a point where we can have the benefits of homogeneity when we're not really homogenous? Yeah, I think what happened in Germany is not a result of homogeneity. I think it's a result of the fact that they saw what happened in the 1930s when large, large segments of the population couldn't make ends meet and sustain a middle-class life, and they don't want to go back there. We could do that too, because that's what we're seeing in the United States. We're seeing that level of political decay. There is nothing so dangerous as a man without a future, and that's what we're seeing in the United States. If you want to see more of it, make sure those people don't get a future. The best social insurance in the world for political stability is giving people who are willing to work hard a solid middle-class life. I don't think anybody can disagree with that. It's just about how do we get there? I really salute you for opening up and going down this path because this is the kind of conversation that people need to have. Like, I mean, you and I have not yelled at each other in this conversation. <laughs> We've not screamed or anything, you know? And I think it's the kind of conversation where people can see the perspectives, where the people are coming from, but then they can also see there is a space. There's a space that makes sense for everyone. It's just a matter of getting there. Well, I just pray that political candidates, Democrat, Republican, I don't care, begin to say this, because if they don't, I fear for our future. Yeah, I think it's pretty easy to argue that even though right now there is not guns in the street civil war yet, it does feel like politically that America is fraying at the edges, perhaps like any other time. I don't know. There's something. It's not positive and things need to be reined in and leaders on both sides need to step up and it's not happening at all. Yeah. Well, I certainly hope it will because the kinds of things that Trump and in this latest military thing is only a good example. He is really hurting the country. I think that people of goodwill have to get together and to say, we really deeply care about this country but part of the honor, part of what we've been able to accomplish in the United States is to give a broad range of people a stable, modest, middle-class life. 
businesses have to, on their own, say, I'm not just going to see how little I can pay my workers and how few hours I can give them because I need a stable political climate in order to run my business going forward. That's something that businesses can do. I think there's a lot of legislation that needs to be put in place. I think that's really the only way out. But I got to tell you, remember that lay that negative on Trump to the white working class. They hear about that six of the 10 most wealthy counties are in the Washington, D.C. area where I grew up. And everyone knows what that means. They know that means a fantastically large bureaucracy with great pensions and all this stuff just to keep the size of government going. That's another thing that the white working class resents on the elite side. So this topic that we're in the middle of can go on forever. And I promise to keep you under an hour. Well, I really enjoyed talking with you. I hope people will look at my book, White Working Class. The paperback edition is just about to come out with a foreword from Mark Cuban. Great, great. Yeah, I'm I'm holding the fine hardcover in my hands, White Working Class, Overcoming Class Cluelessness in America. Hey, Joan, is there a website you want to send people to? Go get the book on Amazon. What would you like to direct anybody to? Yeah, people, go get the book on Amazon, the new edition, bright red cover with a wonderful foreword by Mark Cuban and another foreword by me is going to be available any day and the hardcover is already available. Just go to your local bookstore or go to Amazon and buy it. I hope as you keep going down this path, we can do a part two conversation in the future. I really enjoyed this. Great. And I also have a website, joancwilliams.com. Thanks, Joan. Thank you. Enjoyed it. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right Trend Following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, Trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.